Everybody's getting quiet. I think that might mean it's time to get started. I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can you call the roll? Miss Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Romine? Here. Senator Sater? Here. Senator Brown? Senator Livla? Senator Shaw? Here. Senator Wallingford? Here. Senator Wasson? Senator Kevney? Senator Lavoda? Here. Senator Nasheed? Here. Thank you very much for being here today. As uh, indicative of all the paperwork that we're seeing flying around here, the issue before us is going to be very complex and a lot of information and a lot of details that we're going to have to go through. Uh, today will be a working session and uh, we will not be having any testimony coming forward, but hopefully be laying the groundwork so that when we do have testimony tomorrow, we can be most successful with that testimony. 28% of our budget is spent on health care. That's roughly $6.7 billion. <clears throat> the next expenditure is our education at 27.3% of our budget. So health care is the single biggest ticket item that we have to manage for our state. And I feel it's a great responsibility, a great duty for us to, to work very hard that we bring something to the body come January that can provide a successful and a thorough and a complete health care presentation to the citizens of our state. With that, I would like to have the committee members introduce themselves, not only who they are and who they represent, but if you don't mind, give us a little bit of background, uh, of your expertise that will most aptly apply to our efforts to set forth with a, uh, a Medicaid reform program. So, uh, Senator Nasheed, if you would like to start, I appreciate it. Good afternoon. I am Senator Jamila Nasheed of the 5th Senatorial District, representing uh, the city of St. Louis. And I can truly say that I have thousands and thousands of uh, uninsured uh, constituents in my district that needs insurance. And I think that what should be important with this committee is not to talk about uh, reform alone because we've had studies done time and time again if we look back to 2005 uh, we have a study that shows we exact that shows that we know exactly what to do when it comes to reform however what's important to me uh, on this committee is Medicaid expansion expansion is my top priority and I hope and pray that we're able to come to a consensus so that we can ensure the hundred the 160,000 people that are uninsured here in the state of Missouri. Thank you. Senator. I'm Wayne Wallingford, state senator from District 27. My master's degree is in healthcare administration. I worked in two hospitals before taking a 25 year career detour. United States Air Force. Come from a long line of healthcare professionals. My wife's a registered nurse. My sister's a registered nurse. My daughter's a registered dietitian. My wife's been registered in every state I lived in when I was in the Air Force, including a registered nurse in the United Kingdom, and I could write a book about that if you're interested in hearing about health care in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. I'm Mr. Chairman, I'm Rob Schaff. I'm a senator from Platte County and Buchanan County, and uh, I've been in the legislature. This will be my 12th year coming up, and during that time I've served on just about every health care related committee, and uh, I'm currently on the Medicaid Oversight Committee that was created by my bill that I handled uh, in 2007, I think, the Medicaid Reform Bill back then. At that time, we, uh, we negotiated the Medicaid Reform Bill to include a study about which is most effective, managed care, uh, ASO's administrative service organization, or fee-for-service, which study was never done. And uh, one of the reasons that we passed that bill back then was because we expected that study to get done, and it was never done. So I come with a certain amount of, of uh, trepidation about agreeing to a whole bunch of things when the piece that's really important doesn't get done. So I'm, I looked at the uh, committee charge 
and I don't see anything on there about expanding Medicaid. I'm, I'm not here to look to expand Medicaid, but to reform the system so that we can provide a more, a more uh, efficient system and spend the dollars that we get well. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce the vice chair of this committee, Senator Slater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure if I have any expertise per se at all, but uh, I'm in my ninth year in the, um, in, in the, not the House, but the House and the Senate. Uh, in, in the House, I was chairman of uh, health care policy for two years, and for five years, I was chairman of um, appropriations for social services, health and senior services, and mental health. So I've had a lot of experience in governmental workings, and, um, and I will, hopefully I can have some valuable input into this committee. Uh, my, my real profession, I'm a pharmacist, and I owned and operated a pharmacy in Cassville, Missouri for 30 years, and I still practice uh, part-time. So I, I am approaching this committee not only from a financial point of view, but a health care outcomes, and I think if, if the dollars follow the health care outcomes, then I think we'll be, be very pleased at, at, uh, at what our product will be. So I appreciate uh, being selected to be on this committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kennedy? Senator Joe Kevney, I represent the four senatorial district, which is the western side of the city of St. Louis and parts of St. Louis County. Um, I currently also serve on the Mold Health Net Oversight Committee, and I served on the interim committee last year on the health insurance exchanges. So um, I'm fairly familiar with most of the, uh, the close relatives of this committee. Um, I, uh, as, a, as opposed to Dr. Schaff here, uh, I'm in favor of expanding Medicaid. Um, so this, this committee, we could have some serious discussions here. Um, the, I think the reason that I'm more, mo most interested in this committee is because I think a lot of our preconceived notions can be dispelled through education. And by getting everybody on the same page, especially this one here, to understand exactly how Medicaid works in the state, um, before we start talking about reforming it, I think we ought to talk and see exactly what it does. And um, I look forward to having these discussions. Um, I'll spend as much time as I need to spend to get something moving here. So, um, with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Paul Lavoe, and I uh, represent the 11th Senatorial District, which is um, Eastern Jackson County, mostly Independence, uh, Missouri. And uh, I, this is my ninth year in the legislature. I was in the House for eight years. And um, early, in, early in my legislative career, I figured out that probably the most important issue that we face is health care, and that I knew little about it. So. Since that time, I um, have tried to educate myself on it and have found that the, one of the biggest issues that we have is um, people who are not covered at all and people who, um, and how would the rest of us make up that uncompensated care. And um, I am really very optimistic and, and uh, appreciative to you, Mr. Chairman, and other people on the committee and the President Pro Tem to create this committee to look at how do we look at Medicaid from a cost-efficient way um, and, and the best system for the people of the state? And I'm very encouraged that we're going to roll up our sleeves and dive into that. I think uh, I do echo uh, Senator Nasheed's thought about expansion as a way to make things more cost-effective and, and efficient. Um, but I also don't believe that's the only thing we need to do. I think it's it's a big thing. But um, I hope that we. Um, we'll have a committee where we're open to many different ideas and kind of look through um, some of those things that uh, um, are tough decisions. And since we have this opportunity, we should really dive in. And uh, I am looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jay Wasson from the 20th Senate District down in the Springfield area. Um, been in the legislature 12 years. Um, View this committee as, uh, I guess, an opportunity uh, to see what we can do. Uh, I don't, I don't believe I've ever spoke with anyone who doesn't think there are 
opportunities to uh, have better outcomes and spend money in a better way uh, in some parts of Medicaid. I don't think I've ever spoke to a soul that would argue with that. Um, whether we get into a conversation, I'm sure we will, about expansion. Uh, I think you've kind of got to, I guess in my old country way of, of looking at things, uh, I'd like to fix the bucket, uh, I'd like to stop the leak before I put more water in. And uh, so I wouldn't pour more water in a bucket that already leaks, and right now, from everyone I've talked to, that's kind of what we have. So I'd like to look at how we, how we view Medicaid and what we can do with Medicaid uh, as far as stopping some of those leaks, and then we can talk about expansion as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Senator. I'd like to introduce my staff and let them introduce themselves. If you have any questions or contact, sometimes you may need to go through them. Brad? Uh, Brad Green, Gary's Chief of Staff. Karen Jacqueline, Administrative Assistant. And they have plenty of years of service. Uh, actually, when I worked as Chief of Staff for Senator Engler, Karen was in that office then, so we've got a good history of working together. My name is Gary Romine. I'm the State Senator for the 3rd District. I have owned and operated my own business for 25 years. Uh, our company pays 90% of the premiums for our employees, and we pay 50% of the premiums for their uh, dependent and uh, spouse. Uh, affordable health care does scare me to some degree. Uh, because of that, I did get a $10,000 refund uh, back in October. Three months later, when I came up for renewal, my premiums went up $60,000. I'm scratching my head still trying to figure that one out. Does that mean I get a $70,000 refund check next year? I don't know. But that being said, uh, I will challenge in every way I can the Affordable Health Care Act and how it will apply to Missouri. When we talk about expanding to 138%, what does that mean? As I look at the data that's been presented to me over the last few months, we go from anywhere from 19% of federal poverty level to 300%. It depends upon what program you're talking about and what individuals you're talking about, what that percentage is. And I guess I try to equate it to uh, the car industry. Ford's got to produce so many cars it's going to do 40 miles per or 40 gallons, 40 miles per gallon, and then so many pickup trucks like mine to get 10 or 12, so that they can blend out at around 28 average. Is that what we're going to do with Medicaid? I don't know, but it's going to be a similar concept. Not everything is going to go to 138 percent and we've got to look at all the programs and all the uh, variables that go into determining what Medicaid is in Missouri and to get that and get it right the most important thing we can do is to get a foundation understanding of what Medicaid is right now and how it exists and then we're going to build off of that on what we need to do we've all got our rhetorical comments that we make but we got to separate truth from rhetoric and that's what this, this committee has been challenged to do with, and that's what we're going to do. Um, let me just read you the committee charges. <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> excuse me, make sure that we're very clear on what the committee has been established to do under Senate Rule 31. Number one, develop, uh, development of methods to prevent fraud and abuse in the Missouri Health Net system. Number two, Advise some more efficient and cost-efficient ways to provide coverage for Missouri Health Net participants. An evaluation of how coverage for Missouri Health Net participants can resemble that of commercially available health plans while complying with the federal Medicaid requirements. Possibilities promoting or promoting healthy behavior by encouraging patients to take ownership of their health care and seek early preventive care. Advice on the best manner in which to provide incentive, including a shared risk and savings to health plans and providers to encourage cost-effective delivery of care. And six, ways that individuals who currently receive medical care coverage through their Missouri Health Net program can, grant, can transition to obtaining their health coverage through the private sector. We have plans to issue this report no later than December 15. Our hearing structure is going to be tomorrow is our open public hearing. We want to hear with every opportunity all the situations, issues from the folks that realize from uh, those that seek help to those that provide the help on what some of the pitfalls and concerns are. 
I have several family members in the medical profession. They've already given me their opinion on what needs to be fixed. But we need to hear from across the state, and that's what tomorrow is going to be. After that, I think we have a good understanding that we have concerns and needs in this state to provide a better health care system in Missouri. So with that, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to start bringing in all the professionals that we can and get down to the nuts and bolts of what needs to be fixed. My plans are, and we'll discuss it as a committee, but I would like to see us create an environment where when we come into a meeting, we're ready to go to work. So I see this committee spending most, if not all of its time, here in Jeff City, where we're in a comfortable environment so that we don't have the distractions of running around the state and trying to set up new venues. And so we'll see how that plays out with the rest of the committee, but that's my thoughts on what we need to do. If we're going to do this, Let's get serious about working on it and spend most of our time, if not all of our time, working on the, the project. We have a website. You can go to uh, the Senate page, go to committees, then to interim, and then you can see the committee on Medicaid reform and transforma transformation. With that, I would like for the panel to introduce themselves, and then uh, they're free to take uh, the desk and present Medicaid 101. Um, I'm Adrienne Krause, I'm Assistant Director of Senate Research. Um, I've been in the Senate since 2005, that year when there was a big Medicaid bill that year. And then we did the Medicaid Reform Commission, 22 <coughs> meetings all over the place. Um, and then 2007, the big Mo Health Net bill, so just kind of watching everything evolve throughout the years and having been here this many years is still everyone will attest to you can't possibly know everything about Medicaid it's just impossible it's just huge um, that's it hi my name is Adam Koenigsfeld and I'm the director of Senate appropriations and I've been with the Senate 2003 there was a short six month stint where I was gone but have done the House Bill 11 which is a majority of the Medicaid budget um, for the staff and was tag teaming with Adrian when we went through all the Medicaid reform and the legislation, but my main primary goal is working on the budget. So if you have a numbers question, I would be your person for that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marga Helsher, and it may seem a little odd, but I am your Director of Accounting, HR, and Information Systems for the Senate. The reason why, and I thank the chairman for inviting me to present today and to kind of put together a packet of information for you, is that for about, I've got 28 years in with the state, uh, eight years of that I spent as CFO for Medicaid and, and or a deputy director for Medicaid. I came back to the Senate December 1st of this last year, and um, so I've been working on just Senate accounting and human resources since then. I have a CPA certificate. Uh, I met many of you when I was director of house appropriations uh, for a while where I was working on appropriations issues like Adam does here. So thank you. I, I'm excited to present. So Senator, whenever you have a question, what would your preference be? Would you want questions as you go along or would you like to have your presentation and then questions at the end? What you're most comfortable with? Um, Probably questions as we go along would be fine. Easy questions are my preference. <laughs> but now, questions going along would be fine, Senator, and then, you know, we've got the, the slides there at the time. Very good. Well, I, I did teach high school for four years, so if that comes into play here, just, just forgive me. But please be ready with your questions as we go along. That way the information she's presenting will be most fresh in our minds. So. Don't be bashful. Be the only dumb question is the one not asked. I use that a few times. But go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's about 44 slides. Some of the information that we have, I've uh, kind of stolen from the department. They've, they've been very helpful with that. Many of the slides you will have know, you know you will have seen if you sat on the appropriations committees. Uh, we've used them over several years, and I think they're just kind of helpful tools. One of the things as you work on transformation is I think it's very distracting when you have all kinds of different numbers floating out there. So if, as consistent as we can be, that's what we'll try to do. 
Um, today, we'd like to go over a background and overview of Medicaid, kind of what our Missouri Medicaid program looks like, the services and service delivery systems that we have, provider reimbursement levels, financing and budget, uh, Adam's going to do part of that presentation, hospital reimbursement, provider tax, uh, ACA and federal health reform, and transformation considerations. Much of the time when I was at Medicaid, I spent a lot of my time in the last three or four years on hospital reimbursement and provider taxes. And Medicaid in Missouri is very complicated, as it is in every single state. Our hospital provider taxes are a little bit of a, sometimes when we want to talk about transformation, they hold us a little hostage uh, because of the way that we finance our program. And I think um, you probably need to consider that and understand that as you're thinking about transformation in Medicaid. What is Medicaid? Uh, it's the nation's largest public health program for low-income Americans. Medicaid is not Medicare. And I know that you all know that. I can't tell you the number of times that I would come over to the Capitol to talk to, say, representatives in their early years, and they would think it was a Medicare, it was really a Medicaid issue, but it was really a Medicare issue. There are two different eligibility, uh, they have different eligibility focuses. Your Medicare is for people over 65 primarily and your disabled populations versus your Medicaid, which we focus on children and pregnant women. Majority of the spending goes to elderly and disabled. You'll see that later. Uh, Long-term services and support, nursing homes, that's a mandatory service under Medicaid where Medicare covers nursing homes. They're gonna cover it for limited time periods and for uh, limited services. Uh, home community-based services, uh, that's another um, big spender for our elderly and disabled population. Uh, what is Medicaid? Medicaid is considered an entitlement, an entitlement in every state. Anyone meeting income and eligibility requirements can enroll. It's jo jointly financed by state and federal governments, and the federal law requires states offer a basic set of benefits. So you have mandatory benefits, and you have uh, certain groups that you need to cover. You have to cover pregnant women, you have to cover kids, you have to cover um, elderly. So there are certain groups that you have to cover. And you have to cover the disabled. Medicaid programs differ greatly from state to state. The federal and state agreements. Uh, you may hear about a Medicaid state plan. The Medicaid state plan, that's the agreement that the, that the state and the federal government enter into that provides the specifics about the Medicaid program. So it's gonna be very detailed. It, the, our Medicaid state plan for the state of Missouri sits in all these huge binders out in front of the, in the Howerton building in front of the director's office. It's a um, compilation of amendments that have happened over time since we've had our Medicaid program. It's very, very detailed. It's gonna cover services, eligibility, provider reimbursement, and cost sharing. It's the agreement that we have with the federal government on our are most of our services. Then you also have waivers. And a waiver is necessary if you need to innovate. The waiver process is very difficult. And it's if you don't put a service in your state plan, you may want to provide a service, for example, to a certain targeted group of, of individuals. Uh, you may want to waive state wideness, for example, like our managed care program is under a waiver because we're not offering it statewide. Uh, the Medicaid Partnership Plan. Uh -huh. um, Marga, because of the Affordable Care Act, is the waiver process a little easier right now because everything's kind of moving around? Or do you? I, I guess I, I would say I don't know. I mean, I'm hearing that there's a lot, there's waivers, states are being offered and approved waivers. Right. The federal government's always been, if you come forward with a waiver that's what they want you to do, then it's going to move forward pretty quickly. Uh, you know, we're going to probably be looking outside the box here a little bit. Then I think it's I, I think it's a difficult process. And I also think okay. it takes more time to do a waiver. So if you assume that you're going to make recommendations, if you pass the approval through the General Assembly like this session, mm -hmm. it still takes months to work a waiver through. Right. And to do all the paperwork and to get the federal government to to approve that waiver. It's just difficult, I mean, if you're doing something outside the box. Okay, thanks. So we've got some waivers that have been pretty easy to get, but some that haven't. Senator Shaw. Yeah, Marga, it's pretty much true, isn't it, 
that the state can provide anything it wants as long as it's willing to pay for it. Yeah, that's true. If you want the federal government to share in the cost, then you have to have the waiver. That would be true. Senator Lavoe. What, what is the what is the basic project or process of the waiver? I mean, who ultimately, the secretary, makes the decision, or who makes the decision of a state gets a waiver? I believe it's the secretary. So there's a process that goes but up Senator, to the secretary. But Senator, we need to we need to verify that. Okay. So our understanding is there's a process that goes up to the secretary, and then right. I imagine it, with the things that are going on, she probably has a stack of them. Well, them. negotiating a waiver goes back and forth between their staff and their staff, okay. and you would have many, many different phone calls. You have different conversations with the with the feds. Um, there are some things. It's like pages and pages of information that they read, they comment on. We may agree to part of the circumstances or part of the provisions that they want us to, requirements that they want to put in, probably we aren't going to agree to, to all, and it just goes back and forth for... Ultimately, they, it's the department, the suggestion of which is the secretary, right? My understanding is the secretary, I don't know, Brian or Linda? Yes. Thanks. A simple question, I guess. Uh, you com commented a while ago how complicated the Medicaid program is. And one of the things that we're looking at in this committee, do we have optimistic that it can be simplified? I think it can be simplified if you would possibly simplify your eligibility. Um, num well, for example, like if you wanted to put, simplify some of the eligibility requirements. But that would be something that maybe social services could speak to. Um, I also think on, for example, the waivers. I think if you talk about mental health waivers, and Keith is here, but if you talk about mental health waivers, they have several different waivers. And you sometimes I always wondered, well, would it be an opportunity to have one comprehensive waiver for mental health and MRDD? Home community based waivers, there's like three different waivers. Could you consolidate those waivers into one? Would you would it require more oversight then because you open up the waivers? The waiver are the uh, uh, the waivers are defined so that you kind of have some control, I guess. But if you simplify the waivers, would you, would you again simplify the opportunity to get into the program and require more oversight or? Well, the department is going to have to oversee the waivers. Um, the more simple the program, the easier it is to oversee. And the other thing is, you know, when you talk about simplifying, it depends on what delivery system that you recommend as you move forward. You know, a fee-for-service delivery system versus a managed care delivery system versus an ASO or what other model, they all have different oversight responsibilities and requirements. Uh, managed care kind of delivery system, you are managing a contract because that that managed care company is providing that care or making sure that that care is getting provided versus a fee-for-service model, which is in those clinical edits, those clinical care management strategies are the responsibility of the department. Understand what I'm saying. This last past session, uh, the senator from the Bowens district, I'm representing from the Bowens district, filed a piece of legislation. I think it was House Bill 700, and it was reducing the uh, federal poverty level to 100 versus 138, and he was wanting to seek a waiver. Uh, my question to you is, are we even eligible to seek a waiver under the Affordable Care ha Act, un under Affordable Care, Care Health Act, when the number, the level is 138? <coughs> Can we reduce it to 100 by way of a waiver? Well, I think that a waiver, you can write a waiver any way that, any way that you want to draft the waiver. It's whether the federal government would provide the, the federal participation at that enhanced rate. But being that we are, you know, under the Affordable Health Care Act, it's a, the 
federal poverty level is 138. That's 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 the law, correct? And and I'm asking that's you, right. and I'm asking you. Yes, we are eligible to submit a waiver, but will that waiver be accepted? Be accepted, being that we are mandated at 138 percent. I'm going to ask Adrian because I don't think that there are any other states that have been able that have gotten their waivers approved. Right. And I think back in December they actually said in a question and answer kind of documentation that they will they don't have the authority because it is in statute at 138. So I think they've said they won't accept the partial expansion to give you that you know enhanced 100 percent rate. I don't know if they'll change you know as things this. But as of, as of as today, now, that's what I that's what I understand. As of today, you can you can't do it. Well, and there hasn't been any other state that has been approved that was due to partial question. implementation. How many other states ask for a waiver? Um, I have here. I mean, there's a list here that I'm going to talk about later in the presentation. There's about six states. Where how many states I have here? Where they'll require some. They will require some sort of waiver. Um, there's only been a few that have actually asked for it, but just by what their um, plans are, it's obvious that they'll need some sort of waiver. But it's all in various stages right now with those ones who have not actually. And it's with different waiver. provisions of the ACA, correct? Mm -hmm. That they're asking for the waiver. Different provisions. With the within. Medicaid expansion. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So just, just not, would kind of like to help clarify a little bit. So if you'd tell me if I'm wrong on this, but. Under the ACA, the federal government is going to pay 100% of the Medicaid cost for expanding everybody up to 138. So your question really, I think, is, Senator, could we just get them to pay 100% of the expansion up to 100%? Well, I don't think they could, that we can do that. But if you want to expand it to 100% and get the normal match, and then at the same time put carrots and sticks into the program so that you know you could make it more efficient and help pay for the expansion up to 100 percent and have them pay the regular whatever it is 65 35 or 60 40 you'd still have to have a waiver to do that if you wanted to just pass a law that says no, we're going to pay up to 100 percent i don't even know that we'd need a waiver we just need to amend our state plan agreement and say that we're going to cover everybody up to 100% um, just by changing the statute and say that's what we do now. And they would probably allow us to do that by amending our state Medicaid state plan. We wouldn't have to have a waiver. Because we can cover people up to 100% now if we want. But the question is always about payment or about changing how we do business with those people that are on the program. Like, are we going to make it so that they have to have a high deductible health plan? Are we going to require them to pay more than the usual copay? Are we going to require them to go to urgent care before going to the emergency room? You know, those kinds of things, we have to have a waiver no matter where we cover them. And if we say, well, we got to do those things to make the program more efficient and then take the savings and cover everybody up to 100%, then we got to have a waiver. Does that help a little bit? I'm listening. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Mark, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but before 2005, the federal poverty level for Medicaid for all classes was 100%, right? Some are not. Because we're. Well, it was, I believe parents was, that's the year we went to 77%. You mean 85? No, the uh, elderly, elderly and disabled, disabled 85. And then we right. the Prior to that, uh, 2003, the elderly and disabled were at SSI, and there was a Senate bill passed in a special session that raised it every year until it hit 100%. Okay, I'm just trying to get a background. It would Brian. be helpful. I'm Brian Kincaid. I'm the Acting Director of Social Services. 
And uh, you, you, Senator, I, I'd say you're right. There were laws, as uh, Adam described, that took the elders and disabled up to 100% in three-year increments, and I think that started in 2002. My recollection is that over that two or three-year period, we increased eligibility for elders and disabled up to 100%. At that time, parents of, uh, of, of low-income children were covered up to 100% of poverty. <coughs> And I believe we even covered, at that point, non-custodial parents who had a child in the program if they were paying their child support. We were paying, they were eligible up to 100% or maybe even 125%. Yeah. And that was the high water mark, and the elders and disabled, I believe, were there for maybe six months or a year. And that's when the, the budget issues caught up and we started uh, and then we reducing those reduce it back. Okay. I thought, I, thought can, that, I thought that was a timeline. I just we can provide the committee with a, a history of yeah, those a history uh, eligibility of Yes, thank you. Uh, the next slide there is the current caseload. This is as of May of 2013. And 532,100 <coughs> kids, 27,240 pregnant women, 77,289 low-income parents, 161,491 persons with disabilities, <coughs> 75,346 low-income elderly for a total of 873,466. In addition, we have about 59,000 uh, women who are receiving a limited services under the breast and cervical program. So as you look at that slide, you know, you see that in Missouri, our primary uh, and population that we cover are, are children. Excuse me. Uh-huh. Can you go back to Yes. Can I ask a question on this first slide? Under the Affordable Health Care Act, how many of those children, uh, how many children would be eligible under the Affordable Health Care Act? Um, Senator, at the very end of the presentation, I've got about three slides that talk about Affordable Care Act, and I think that that will, you'll see there how many kids are, the projections for the number of kids would be picked up under ACA in Missouri. I'm not trying to make this whole committee about hearing about ACA. I'm just, you know, as we go along. I'm yeah, it, it's toward the end of the presentation, if that's okay, Senator. Okay. <coughs> this map, this is one that the department's used for years, um, looking at where the average um, health net participation is. 148.7 people participate per 1,000 Missourians. The red would be the most of the population, those counties in the red have more Medicaid participants per 1,000. I asked you a question about that. Mm -hmm. this, this, I know this is a deep question, but do we know why that is? What, what makes it, what makes areas have higher participation than other areas? I would say it's a function of the income levels within the, those areas okay. and possibly too that you know the elderly have um, you know where it 85 you know could be the, the the number of seniors that we have in those areas and the number of disabilities. Okay. Thank you. Good question. In Missouri, DSS is the single state agency uh, for the Medicaid program. That's a designation that's required in federal law. It's the agency that's responsible for administer administering the <coughs> Medicaid state plan. MoHealthNet is the state's Medicaid agency, but there are also Medicaid services that are being provided and administered with Department of Mental Health, Health and Senior Services, and DESE. On this slide, and you get some of you may have seen this before, this is something that we prepare in appropriations, but this is just kind of a snapshot of, this is the total state budget, this is all funds, this is general revenue, all, any other provider taxes, um, federal funds. When you look at it, just said a dollar bill, and this is by department, and as Marcus stated, Medicaid is across three, or, it's three departments, four with DESE, and as the chairman uh, mentioned earlier, if you just pull out the Medicaid piece for all funds, it's around 36 to 38 cents of the dollar we spend on health care, Medicaid, basically in general. With uh, the education, the second largest chunk. And 
then on this slide, obviously these are the dollars that we tend to be most concerned about, and this is looking at a general revenue side of it. When you look at uh, Medicaid, just the Medicaid portion that GR uses, it's about 22 cents of the dollar because of the state, Missouri State Medicaid is very uh, creative and has been very aggressive with the provider taxes, and that is the provider taxes act as a GR equivalent, which that does not show up on this slide. This is just general revenue tax dollars and how they're spent across the state departments. This is Missouri's portion. This is state general revenue, correct. The next slide, this shows the, this is the FY 2014 budget that was passed. And this shows uh, the departments, the total Medicaid by department, with social services being the large one. They have the biggest chunk of it. And mental health, health, and DESE has a small portion with first steps and some of their state operated schools. So when you look at it, all funds, we're approaching $9 billion for Medicaid, and that's budget. And then $1.8 billion of that is general revenue. This next slide uh, provides you a little bit of the relationship with DSS MHD and then DMH, DESE, and DHSS. And there are, those are the four agencies. Uh, social services, it's primarily responsible for those services that are other than, than what DMH, DHSS, and DESE provides. They also do the federal cash management, maintain the MMIS system and the clinical tools, maintain the Medicaid state plan. Um, they review and submit all waivers and develops care strategies for the disabled and some of those other, uh, for the chronic care side that isn't related to mental health. Um, DMH does the mental health services, CPS, the services for the disabled, the DD side, ADA, alcohol and drug, uh, operates the waivers uh, that are responsible, that are for their populations. And then DESE is going to do state-operated schools, first steps, as Adam said, and then DHSS is responsible for the home community-based services for the seniors. And they also do home delivered meals. Now, just a question, Mark. You said up front at the very beginning that Medicaid is an entitlement, and yet there are waiting lists for ADA services. So is it an entitlement for those services or not? Well, I think if, if there are services under a waiver, then you can limit the number of people that you have, you provide those services to. So our services that we give where there are waiting lists are under a waiver. I'm going to let Keith help here. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Keith Schaefer. I'm Director of the Department of Mental Health. As it relates to the uh, alcohol and drug abuse program, which is called CSTAR, Substance Treatment, and rehabilitation. That is not a waiver. That is a plan amendment. It's just that very few people qualify for that. So if we have a wait list, it's usually center outside the Medicaid program, they're not eligible for Medicaid. In the Division of Development Disabilities, there are waivers. Uh, there, there are waivers and there are waivers because a waiver is not an entitlement. Uh, one of the things that we waive is uh, we need eligibility for services. So. On the DD side, you do have a waiver, and you have a waiver for the availability of funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick facts, you'll hear MMIS system. That is the Medicaid Management Information System. That is the state claims processing system. You know, when we're thinking about our Medicaid program, 99.8 million claims were processed in FY12. I mean, that's a lot of claims for two providers. Uh, payments in excess of $8 billion. The average claim processing time is less than a day. We still only pay two times a month, but we are processing those claims less than a day. Over 99% of the claims submitted electronically. There's over 41,000 providers, 68 different provider types, and our Medicaid MMIS system has thousands of edits in place to make sure that services are appropriately if a claim comes in, that, that that service isn't like a duplicate payment, it's something that we covered, and that person's eligible. 
but again from this slide I guess I just wanted to make sure that the committee understood how many claims and how massive a program that it, it was. Um, some of the comments that I've received have been the claims process have not been as efficient as it could be. Is there reason why that may be the case or is that special circumstances or how, how much if it <coughs> is it a problem? Well, I think if there's a claim claim that hits our system, meaning the person was eligible, the claim isn't a duplicate, it, it's been billed properly, then I think that these stats are, are right. It could be that, you know, one thing, that the, the billing is difficult for Medicaid. And there's all kinds of different billing, you know, Medicare would have someone bill differently than Medicaid. And so it's kind of complicated. But I think generally our system works pretty well. Margaret, so we still have some um, some providers who do not submit electronically. You say 1% would be quite, maybe it's more than 99%. It's, yeah, it is, it's over 99% of the claims. We yeah. can probably get that data for you as far as what most are submitted electronically. Do we Very have to are. allow people to provide services if they don't submit electronically? Or would that be a... I think we require our providers to submit electronically now. I need to go back and take a look at that. Because I think that there is a requirement that they do submit electronically, but there may be some moms and pops that we just kind of let them go for right now. Or it might be a claim that's been corrected that has to be made. Senator, I can't tell you, Brian Kincaid again, uh, I can't tell you exactly the reason why those 1% would be there, but we'd be glad to, to get them back to the committee. I would think it'd be like 99.9%. <laughs> uh, when you get into issues with where there's uh, Medicare and Medicaid involved, where there's private insurance involved, sometimes these claims can get complicated. Now, that is certainly not the 1%. So uh, whether they're small providers, certain services, or special services, or if these are just things that, for whatever reason, have to be handled by paper, we can uh, okay, just look at the information. You know, the cost effectiveness. So. Absolutely. Okay. I understand that. Some quick facts. Pharmacy, there's 315,000 average monthly pharmacy users, 13.2 million claims a year. 1.16 billion was budgeted for FY14. Uh, pharmacy is carved out of the managed care contracts. Nursing facilities, uh, nursing facility services is a mandatory service for Medicaid programs. 23,387 average monthly users in FY12. 8.3 million days are provided. The average per diem rate in 12 was 138.37, $138 a day. Over 60% of the occupied beds are paid by Medicaid. Provider rates, I know that um, Senator Schaaf has been interested in provider rates over time. Um, overall rate for <laughs> 2013 was 57% of Medicare. And this was right out of the most recent parity study. The, the department's required to provide to do a parity study annually. And you see there ambulances at 40%. Um, Audiology is at 45%, dental is at 37% of UCR, durable medical equipment is at 86%, optical 40%, physician 59%, rehab, and rehab center, center therapy is at 20%. What you don't see on here are those services that don't have Medicare comparisons. And so you don't see hospital services. And hospital services, the reason is because they pay on a different basis than Medicaid. Hospital services, uh, Medicare pays on a DRG basis. We pay on a per diem basis. So they get paid based on their volume versus episodes of care, which a DRG system would have. On the durable medical equipment, is there a program for, I guess, rental or leasing of the equipment instead of acquisition, which would be a way to save a tremendous amount of money? Uh, right, there, there is a program where they do rent equipment we can get you more specifics on that, on how that's handled. Senator Kennedy. Could, could 
you could pick one of those topics and walk me through that. Let's take the first one, the ambulance. When you say 2013 rate as percent of Medicare, 40 percent, what exactly does that mean? That means that what Medicare pays for a similar service is um, what I'm sorry, what Medicaid would pay for a, for a Medicare service is 40 percent of what Medicare pays. Oh, okay, so all right. So for ambulance services, how they look at this and how they develop it, if you think about it, there's many, many, many codes. Right. And so they roll those codes up into, and they group them. So in the ambulance codes, Medicare is paying a much higher rate than Medicaid is for a similar service. So M Medicare is the federal program. Yes. So the feds are paying $100 for an ambulance. The state's only paying 40 Right. Just the the science of deciding how much the state pays for these things really there isn't any science is there isn't it pretty much based upon the year-to-year -year appropriation and what according to the statute and there's really three bodies of statute 208.151 2 and 3 right and uh, 208.151 defines who's covered, 208.152 defines what's covered, and 208.153 defines how they get paid for it, right? Pretty much. Well, isn't, doesn't the statute say that, that Medicaid is supposed to cover on the basis of cost? I mean, generally that's the language. But we don't actually do anything to figure out what stuff costs, do we? Well, I think there are certain providers that are paid based on cost, and, uh, and we do do things. There. Like, for example, hospitals. Yes, we get cost reports for hospitals, and we look at hospital costs. So, basically, hospitals are supposed to get their cost, uh, and they submit a cost report, and they get their cost. But we don't do anything at all, do we, to determine what it costs to provide the ambulance ride, what it costs for audiology, and so on, correct? Ba basically what happens is, is that the ambulance service, they figure out how much they're losing on Medicaid, and then they figure out how much more they have to charge everyone else in order to make ends meet. And so as an industry, they negotiate contracts with private insurers for more than what it really costs them to provide care, and then they take the excess to cover their losses under Medicaid because they just really have to take care of Medicaid people. Is that not pretty much the truth? Could I interject something, Senator? When it comes basically nuts and bolts about it, yes, it's determined by appropriation. But a pot of GR is only so big, and unless there's a provider tax, then it's the slice of the piece of pie that they get. Right. And so, and so the provider tax really is just another mechanism that we use to try to to continue to pay this. I mean, it's kind of a gimmick, actually. And this is one of the structural problems that we have. We don't figure out. We, you know, we just pretty much kind of ignore the law. But we do it for selected populations or for selected providers, and it's really determined by the political strength of those providers. And not to argue with you, but there are a lot of things in state statute that we do not fund. We are, what, next year will be 600 and some million behind on the foundation formula. You know, in 2007, when we passed the reform, one of the negotiations was that we would cover dental for the ABD population, you know, dental care, because little old ladies in nursing homes, they can't get their teeth worked on, so they end up in the emergency room. and. Lo and behold, the governor didn't recommend that it be funded. So we never did cover it. Anyway, thank you. Next time. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Margo, uh, are all Medicare rates, say, for, for audiology, are they the same throughout the country? Or, or is it different? I believe they're different by region. 
I think when we go out to look at, at the Medicare rates, they uh, have different, they can be different by region. It would be. So the Medicare rate that we pay somebody in uh, southwest Missouri would probably be different than in I thought Chicago. it was region. Yes, yes. Like within Missouri, I think most of those regions are the same. No, okay, well, I guess what I was trying Medicare to get to is that are the Medicare rates a figure that we can really go off of to compare what what our providers in a local area would be normally charging, like prevailing wage? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, Medicare is what, the Medicare parity is what's in the law and what the department has to do as far as okay. the benchmark. Uh, there's quite a bit of clinical management that goes on on our fee-for-service population the department does. A lot of these uh, edits and authorizations are done transparently. They're done through our system. Uh, Medicaid, they certify inpatient stays. They do clinical edits, early refill edits. Dose, these are just examples, by the way. Dose optimization on the pharmacy claims. Opt optical authorizations, DM DME prior authorizations, psychology prior authorizations. Um, imaging prior authorizations and all of these things are done to pro make sure that the appropriate care is provided and that we're not paying for too much like in the instance of an inpatient pre-cert they have to certify those days before just like many of our insurance companies require eligibility this slide shows the required the federally mandated eligibility level and where our current state eligibility level is. Pregnant women, we're at 185, and the federal mandated level is 133. The preschool children, we're at three, up to 300 percent, but we require premiums for those. Those are in our CHIP program. Um, we're required to cover up to 133. Then we've got um, school-age children there. Seniors and persons with disabilities were required to cover 74, we're at 85. Custodial parents, which is that TANF level, 19%. Childless adults were at zero. Senator Shaw, just one, one thing that's got to be noted on here is that seniors and persons with disabilities, there truly is no limit because there's a spend down. They can be at 500% of the poverty level, correct? And as long as they write their payment check, they can get down to 85% and we'll still cover them. As long as they spend down to that. No. Uh, this would provide your annual income rates for your federal poverty levels. So there you've got family size one through six and then the various levels. And we probably need to print this out and put this in your folder <coughs> so that as your going through um, the transformation conversation, you would know what is 100% for a family of four. <coughs> this is MoHealth Net enrollment over time. And you can see up to approximately a million back in 2005. Uh, this is a slide that if you've sat on the appropriations committees in either the House or the Senate, uh, this is a really neat slide. We on the panel had talked about it when we were going through the slides. This is um, when you look at our enrollees, the left-hand column is your enrollees, 893,976. That was the average monthly enrollees in state fiscal year 12. Kids are 60.5%. <coughs> but of the enrollees, but we're only spending about 25% of the total dollars, Medicaid dollars, spent on kids. The persons with disabilities are 18.7%, and we're spending 48.5% on those folks. Seniors, 8.7, and we're spending 1.2 million. And then pregnant women and custodial parents 12.1 versus 8.9. So those populations, the most costliest populations are those that are disabled, which makes sense. Inpatient hospital care, it's the most costliest care. 
in nursing facilities, they're driving those costs. These are examples of the mandatory services on the left, optional services there on the right, and then there are other optional services as well, dental, but this is uh, the primary services, physician, nurse practitioner, nurse mid midwife, hospital services, inpatient and outpatient, lab, family <coughs> planning services and supplies, and EMT, FQHC, and rural health clinic services, and EPSDT services and also nursing facilities is mandatory too. Optional prescription drugs, eyeglasses, case management. In Missouri we have we're two different service delivery models. We have fee-for-service. In the fee-for-service model you've got seniors, persons with disabilities, and children and parents outside the managed care counties. In that model the state's at risk for the service cost. On the managed care side, you've got children and parents inside the managed care counties, and I think that's around 430,000 typically is what is enrolled in managed care. Uh, 108, 1.18 billion was budgeted for our managed care in FY12. Managed care plans are at risk for cost of services. Question uh, in that, have we done any cost comparison taking a community like Springfield compared them to a community that's in a managed care and determined that the state saves any money if at all with a managed care system as opposed to a fee-for-service? Is there any data that can tell us which is the best program? Right. Uh, there were several years ago we presented some information to the Oversight Committee where we did uh, and looked at managed care and compare the managed care versus fee-for-service and if there was savings or not um, but we didn't look if at certain areas like Springfield versus um, Columbia or you know a, a certain area with, with a different size and then it was always complicated because of the way the provider taxes and the hospital add-on payments were made but there was there was a study that was done by uh, actuary several years ago that looked at managed care versus fee for service. Mr. Shaw, this, this is the really, really important question. And in my opening statement, I pointed out that in the Medicaid reform bill previously, we set up a plan to look and see whether managed care ASOs, ASOs are uh, entities that manage the care but don't take risk, or versus fee for service, which is the most effective and, and the study has to be designed such that if you have similar patients going through and getting similar care which one costs the state more well that study has never adequately been done and when you read the studies that are purported to say one you know managed care they usually say well managed care is effective they're done by managed care companies or they're done by people that are hired by managed care companies <laughs> Other states, some other states have gotten rid of their managed care programs saying that it saved money to get rid of it. One of the problems is, is that the payment has to be actuarially sound. Well, if it's actu actuarially sound, that means that it is very unlikely that the managed care company is going to lose money providing the service. Another thing is that there's automatic rate increases built into the managed care payments, which fee for service, I mean, I can tell you as a physician, I haven't got any pay increase, you know, and I've been taking Medicaid for many years until recently, but um, I'm not, I don't myself believe that managed care saves money. I, I, I can prove it. They have the data. They're over time, uh, in various committee settings, I've asked, do we actually get the data from the managed care company? For example, if a person comes and sees a physician in your area outside of the I-70 corridor and fee for service, well, they know exactly how much they're paying for what. The Medicaid department does. An office visit, 20 bucks. Okay, they know. 
if the same service is delivered inside the managed care area, you know, a doctor who's working for uh, some managed care company, they have a contract with the managed care company. We, the state, write the check for the care, but we don't really know how much the doctor is getting paid uh, for what. Now, so I've asked, do we actually get the data? And initially I was told, no, no, we don't get the data because that's secret. But then later on they started saying, oh, no, no, they do have the data, but they've never really looked at the data to see. I believe that the department has the data and they could do matched studies if they wanted and they could answer the question. And this is something that this committee ought to look at. But, uh, I would say this is most important to our decision-making process for reforming the Medicaid presentation in Missouri. We need to know which is the better system of the two. And is there a way that an actuarial can be done on that in a timely manner so that we can incorporate it into our decision-making process? Because I, I, you got to show me the money. I mean, if I'm going to support any change in Medicaid, it's got to be based upon facts and figures, dollars and cents, and, and I, I would say that's what most of this committee is about is, you know, if we're going to reform the program, let's reform it into something that's efficient and cost effective. So uh, I guess I'm asking at this point, can we get some empirical data that shows the difference between managed care and fee for service as the most cost effective way of taking care of our folks? Well, I think that we can, we do get the and counterclaims, like the department gets in counterclaims for every single service that's provided by a managed care company. So they do get in counterclaims. The problems that we've had in the past with looking at those claims have been uh, maybe a hospital, they bill it differently. You know, like say they contract with a, a managed care plan, contracts with a hospital for a delivery charge, but in that delivery, they might have a bunch of codes where we're going to pay for it separately. And it was kind of hard to, to get at the actual comparison. You understand what I'm trying to say there? So then, now, can we have an actuary take a look at managed care again? And I think that, you know, there's, that's a possibility. I, I don't know, you know, during what time frame we can kind of work with the Department of the Data and see what, what we can get done. I think that they could do it, but actuarial studies are expensive and might have to have an appropriation in order to pay for it. I mean, this is a big deal to do an actuarial study. The, another problem that we have is hospitals get paid on a different way than other providers. They get paid on a cost basis. And literally, they can anything that they write on their cost report, they get that, like if, let's say that they have 20% Medicaid patients. If they give their CEO an extra million dollars of salary, the state of Missouri is going to pay 20% of that extra million. I mean, it, it's a very perverse system. One of the things this committee ought to look at, if they're serious about doing it more efficiently, is adopting the Medicare payment system, which is a DRG basis. They get paid, like if you have pneumonia, everybody who has goes into the hospital with pneumonia gets the same amount. That DRG basis, just doing that one thing, could have a huge impact on us and how we how we save money. The other thing is, is that you've got to give providers the incentive to save money. And when you have this cost-based reimbursement for hospitals, they have no incentive under that. They they actually have an incentive to spend more money. Uh, if you think about it, if you were a hospital CEO and you knew that they were going to you know, put the bill for 20% or 30% of whatever you put on there, hey, that's it's a good deal. I'm sorry, back to the actuarial study though. We do have actuaries contracted with social services that it's possible they may have some resources that they've already gotten in their budget that they may have, they may want to look at it again. I don't know, maybe we could work with them. I, I mean, I would like to know what the cost, mm -hmm. if that's, that's a factor, but I think it's, it's important to our decision-making process that we have that data to go forward with. So I, I would ask that as soon as we can have that information and possibility, I appreciate it. Senator. In 2005, I'm sure we covered uh, managed care under the 2005 study. 
Wouldn't that be correct? There was discussion about managed care. And there, there were recommendations as well. So my question to you is, and, and I, I just think we're spinning the wheel here, because we've been here. We, we've had these discussions. In 2005, we had a discussion on managed care. And we're back here again today talking about what we should do to better provide managed care. And we have recommendations. And the question that I would pose to the, the committee as well as you guys is how much of that did we actually implement? Are we going to continue to have these conversations about managed care plans and then put it on the shelf? Or can we just go back and look at what 2005 uh, recommendations were and implement those? I mean, what, I mean I, I'm just trying to see what the plan here is. Uh, because, I mean, we have, we, we have study, studies from the Missouri Foundation for Health dealing with um, uh, managed care. We have the uh, recommendations from 2005 dealing with managed care. And my question to you is this here. Have we implemented any of those recommendations? And if, we're, if we haven't, why not? Because if we did, we would know we, would, we wouldn't be here today, or we would be going over those recommendations, saying if they have, if they were effect, effective or not. So, again, my question to you is this: the, were, were any of those recommendations actually implemented by way of legislation? The 2005, uh, 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 2005 recommendations of managed care. Senator, I know later the departments are going to actually speak to that. I think that was their charge to come over here today was to look back at that report and see what was implemented and what was not implemented. Um, I think, yes, some have been and some have not. We, we will get a report. That's, a, that's part of the agenda coming up. And that's the reason why part of your package is a summary of that 2005 Medical Commission report. So we're going to get an update. And I'm not all about recreating the will and and saying that we're starting from scratch. We have some data and information that's a foundation. We're going to build off that, but I think we do need additional data that proves that one system is more cost effective for the state than another. But here in just a little bit, hopefully you'll get asked that question again if it's not answered by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. Uh, this is where managed care these are the counties that managed care operates in Missouri. Now, you know, you hear about managed care on the I-70 corridor, but when, when managed care was expanded, now there's 54 counties. And when you hear that, it's really beyond the managed the I-70 corridor. A lot of rural counties now have managed care. A um, little bit on cost and financing of the Medicaid program. The FMAP is generally based on a per capita income. Statutory floor is 50%. Uh, Missouri's regular match rate is 62%. There are enhanced FMAPs for certain populations, and if the federal government wants to promote a federal priority, they'll have a different FMAP, like for electronic health records, there was 100% FMAP. Um, sometimes there's 90% offered for MMIS technology initiatives, uh, I think 75% for program integrity. Uh, the administrative match is generally 50%. I know if it's a licensed, skilled medical professional, they're, I think, 75%. Margaret, can I mm -hmm. interject something? A common misconception about the Medicaid program is whether you're for or against Medicaid expansion is all this influx of federal funds and even for the regular Medicaid program. Common misconception is first the state must spend the dollar before we get the 60 cents back. And that's what, you know, the department pays for the services and then each month they settle up with the feds to receive the federal portion back. And sometimes that's a, a misunderstanding that's out in the people talk about but you're for or against it, but that's the one thing, is we must spend it first and then we're reimbursed in arrears. Just so that's everybody's clear on that, and I think that's sometimes misunderstood. Not a check at the end of the year, or beginning of the year. Right. right. This is 
is another slide where we talk about the per member per year cost by different populations. Again, it's your seniors and your persons with disabilities that's your highest cost for eligible. Your custodial parents, your kids, pregnant women, uh, they don't cost nearly as much as what those seniors and persons with disabilities do. Um, provider taxes, uh, we, <coughs> excuse me, uh, provider taxes are defined in federal statute. They must be broad based and uniform. Um, providers cannot be held harmless from the tax. Uh, the, uh, there's a safe, safe harbor rate of 6%. That's why our taxes are typically designed at 595, five and a half to keep us under that uh, hold harmless amount so that we don't have to prove that, there, that anyone's been held harmless. Uh, nearly all states have at least one provider tax, most popular are nursing home, hospital, IC, ICX. In your packet, in your folder, there was a uh, page of different provider taxes that we have. We have hospital, nursing home, pharmacy tax, ICF, MR tax, or ICF tax, um, ambulance tax. There's an in-home provider tax that was in statute, but the feds never have deemed that permissible. Now this tax goes to Missouri to the feds? Goes to Missouri. The way a provider tax works is that it's an assessment on a certain group of providers. It's a health care related provider. There are certain, I think there was like around 19 different kinds of providers that could be, have a health care related tax. They pay an assessment or they provide a service and then they submit a claim through our MMIS system. We offset that claim we're not going to pay that claim because we're going to draw the federal match in. I mean that, I'm sorry, that serves as your assessment or your tax. Okay, because we're going to assess the hospital for doing business in the state. Then at that point, we're going to draw the federal match on that amount of the assessment. If they use it on a Medicaid service, they get that federal match on that service. So that's the reason why that your hospitals are able, because they provide their own state match for many of their add-on payments. In the, in the sense of like in the case of the ambulance taxes and the ambulance, then we've enhanced rates to make that tax work. So that's an important piece of this that the committee needs to be aware of is the history of how we almost got lost our Medicaid program by abusing this with the federal government or being not necessarily that we abused it but that they thought that we were. Mm -hmm. the, the thing about it is is if you have a whole bunch of providers, let's say hospitals, some of them don't provide hardly any Medicaid and some of them provide almost all Medicaid. So if they all have to pay the money, like say 5% of their gross charges, then the ones who don't have any Medicaid pay the 5%, but they don't get anything back. They don't want to do that. The ones who, you know, pay their 5%, they get a whole bunch back because they mostly Medicaid payments. So if they get paid more per Medicaid, they get a whole bunch back. So this is the problem, and the federal government said, did they not say that there was a test and that this program had to meet a test? Some of the people had to be paying in and not getting anything back, basically. So what's the status of that? The, they, the federal government really started to ding us not well, that long ago. But that, the Medicaid partnership plan that was on one of the earlier slides, back in, I know that our most recent one was like 2008 or 2009, we agreed under the Medicaid partnership plan to provide the federal government with different, in, for additional information. And in so, we kind of protected our provider tax. You know, we provide them with budget information up front. We work with them and at each cycle during the session, like House, Governor, Senate, each cycle. So we give them that information. And we've also agreed on the tax base. So we've laid it out for them that we're only going to tax net patient revenue and, it, and, and they monitor us. Now, we have never done anything wrong in the state when it comes to our provider taxes. We've aggressively pursued provider taxes just like any other state. You know, that's the one thing, you know, I've heard people call it a scam, a scheme. 
it's a legitimate funding mechanism that the federal government has allowed. All kinds of states use it. We've just had the opportunity here with our providers to work with them to be able to get that provider tax um, to be able to maximize payments. So, you know, I guess I've always said it's 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 allowable. It's a it's a any other state can do it. We do have redistribution arrangements, but yeah. that's in the code of federal regulations, and we comply with with that. And we meet our B one B two tests, the tests that you were talking about, um, and we make sure that you know our Medicaid hospitals are taken now, care of said, and nursing homes. And when you said redistribution agreements, this is an important thing for the committee to understand too. Is it not true that, say, the hospital association sort of handles their redistribution? It's kind of like they have a side agreement. Now, tell me if I'm wrong, but there are some hospitals that, you know, they pay in more than what they get back. So in order to get all the hospitals to participate, they kind of have an agreement among themselves that the ones that are getting highly paid will kind of like send some cash over to the ones who are losing, sort of? I mean, is that not kind of what's going on? That's the way most provider taxes work. You know, a state can do a provider tax where they, ta you know, more like a, a typical state or a typical tax that doesn't have a redistribution arrangement on the backside. So states can either do a, a straight up assessment and then that assessment is deposited in general revenue or whatever kind of fund that they that they want to deposit the money in, use that as federal mat, use that to match federal government payments, and then pay a provider. What is also allowable under federal law, as long as you meet these tests, is a redistribution arrangement. We do it on our nursing homes, we do it on our hospitals. Um, I, I'm not sure if we do it on our ambulance, we do it on our pharmacy. And that's allowable under federal law. But if they meet that B1, B2 statistical test that they do, then we've, we're providing the, um, we're taking care of our Medicaid providers. So it's allowable. I, I guess my question is, making it sound like it's a bad thing, what's, what's the bad thing about it? Well, for a while, we were worried that the federal government was going to disallow our FRA funding program. Yeah, this is the third biggest tax in Missouri, the FRA tax. Most people don't know that. And uh, uh, if you're going to talk about how hospitals get paid under Medicaid, that's an important piece. There's a, there are perversities in the payment scheme. The, this is part of the payment scheme. Senator Watson? Ted, do you know yet just how much uh, the Affordable Care Act will affect this? How we're doing these? Or will it at all? Senator, I'm sorry on your question, how the ACA will affect our provider taxes? Exactly. We will. Will they still be allowed? We still, for instance, I think at one point that? there. I think at one point there was some um, proposals to restrict the amount of provider taxes that states could. I remember some talk about that. That's why. And I'm there was a lot of effort by Missouri to make sure that we protected our provider taxes. And my understanding is that they've kind of backed away right now. There isn't any proposal. Maybe Linda's closer than I am, but they've backed away from that restriction. Many states have gone ahead and, and approved new provider taxes to get them through some of the budget challenges that just happened in the last five years. So, you know, they were expanding. It's, it's an allowable financing mechanism for state Medicaid programs. I just wanted to know if it affected mm -hmm. what. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things, one of the recommendations here on this slide is that if you are looking at transformation recommendations that you've got to consider the impact on the provider taxes because they are significant. A billion dollars worth of an assessment for hospitals generates about over two billion dollars worth of payments for hospitals. Um, hospital reimbursement, we've talked a lot about this already. 
Um, it, it is complicated. I'm not going to go over through each one of these payments, um, but <coughs> the provider taxes are such a significant funding source. The one thing, you know, the hospital association and hospitals will say, well, we're paying for all of our payments. Under managed care, there's a lot of general revenue that's going to managed care, and I, you know, I think it's around 60% of those payments are really paid to hospitals. And that is a general revenue payment. May I ask a sure. So basically, hospitals write down all of their costs on a, on a cost report. All the costs that they would spend <coughs> in a year to take care of all their patients. And then there's a fraction of that that's attributed to Medicaid. How do they calculate the fraction? Is it based on gross charges to the Medicaid population that they see? That's what I've been told. Senator, I would have to get, I'd have to take a look at a cost report. That's, it's been a while. That's critically important, but let's just say that the hospital has 30% Medicaid based upon 30% of all their charges was for providing services to Medicaid patients. Ultimately, after they get their per diem and then they get the add-on payment at the end, they should at the end get 30% of everything they wrote on their cost report, correct? That's how they're paid. Well, they're, they're paid very, they're paid different kinds of payments, but it's it's based on cost. Um, well, <coughs> well, see, the, the thing about it is, is that um, if they know that they're going to get 30%, let's say they have 30% Medicaid, if they know that they're going to get 30% of their cost reimbursed by the federal government, or by, by the state and federal government, they truly don't have any incentive to save when they, you know, buy a widget for use or whatever. This is one of the problems, Mr. Chair, is that the payment system doesn't incentivize hospitals to save any money. And, and so as we look through this, <coughs> we need to think about what we could do to give them that incentive. I mean, and all providers. You make a note. I am. This just gives, gives you an idea of how many units of inpatient and outpatient services that <coughs> we are paying for and by what population groups. Um, disproportionate share payments. You're going to hear a lot about DISH. Um, DISH payments are for un uncompensated care. This is subject to the federal allotment cap. The feds have, they allot so much money for all states uh, to pay for their DISH programs. The one thing that you don't hear a lot about is it's also subject to hospital-specific costs. It's like a hospital-specific DISH limit now. That's unrelated to the ACA. Uh, it is, was a rule that was filed several years ago. And so we cannot pay DISH unless that hosp to any specific hospital unless they've incurred cost. Um, and that's unreimbursed Medicaid cost, or that's Medicaid cost, Medicaid managed care cost. Um, so you have, there are some hospitals that, are un that we've paid more DISH to than what their costs support. And in those cases, we're having to pull back money. In 2014 is the first year I think that that will happen. Um, federal allotment reduction under ACA was 5% for the, for the first three years, 15 for the next, and 50 thereafter. Um, that gives you a uh, sense, the next bullets, on how many, 511 million to hospitals, 37 million to DMH, that's total payments. Um, dish reductions were written in the federal bill. So it would take a federal law change if, for the dish reductions not to go into effect. Secretary had a lot of, of responsibility in determining that the way that the funds were cut. 
based on percentage of uninsured states use of dish and if they were, if we were a high dish state. New federal rule was issued in May. And I'm not exactly for sure. I think it gave the allotments for what the cuts would be. I mean, if anyone's interested, we may need to get that to you. Why um, increasing the Medicaid eligibility is important in Missouri hospitals. The dish reductions will happen, but it's not just Medicaid. They're getting hit by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, many hospitals at hospital-specific dish caps, again, we talked about that. Um, Medicare dish cuts um, are going to be comparable to Medicaid. And then there are other Medicare payments impacted. The one thing that the committee, when, when people come and CEO, hospital CEOs come to you and want to talk to you about dish cuts or Medicaid cuts, there are often times where they didn't understand it may not have been a Medicaid cut that was put forward. It was Medicare, it was some other change, you know, they're only looking at their kind of their bottom line or their revenues coming in, but oftentimes Medicaid may not have even made a change to their reimbursement system, but their payments were going down. So I think if you have a hospital administrator come to you, you might ask, you know, get more information because it may be that we just can't pay them for some other reason. <clears throat> some of the materials that I've looked at it have indicated that the hospital stood to lose $3.3 in Medicare cuts, roughly $700 million in dish payments, mm -hmm. $4 billion. But now the $4 billion we're talking about to expand Medicaid to 138% is really not new money. It's just the same money rebranded. Is that not correct? I think, I think some of it is probably rebranded. So we're being held hostage for money we was already getting before. So. It's being, yeah, it's being reallocated. Thank you. Can I ask a question? I'm basic. Take, walk me basically through this. DISH is there because there's a lot of people who don't have Medicaid. Right? Right. It's so that's how it relates to the Medicaid program. Tell me how it relates. To, I mean, it's administered by the Medicaid. Or who's administered by? Well, dish payments, dish payments are made by the Medicaid agency. Okay. They're made by the Medicaid agency. Right. Which is a hospital or... Right. No, I'm talking about it's dish payments are payments that are made by social services, Mo Health Net Division, okay. to, hospitals to hospitals for providing uncompensated care. Right. And they have to, you know, they have to meet certain requirements. You know, they have to take care of... Um, OB, you know, like OB patients, and they have they have certain requirements that under the federal rules that a hospital has to do. In Missouri, we've been able to maximize that because of our provider tax. You know, we've been able to maximize, and, and basically all hospitals can qualify for DISH. Well, I I guess when we're looking at this eligibility, I mean the reason. That the dish is going away because the idea is that eligibility would go up and there wouldn't be as much uncompensated care, so they wouldn't need that reimbursement for uncompensated care. That was the reason why I believe the federal government, when they scored it, that's right. what they were, that was right. the and, trade off. And without giving more people a way to compensate, compensate for their health care and not paying the hospitals, there's going to be even more of that cost to the hospital for uncompensated care. Am I following that correctly? Because there would be less people who can pay for it. And no other way for them to make it up. But that, I guess I want to, I guess I'm bringing this up because we're, we could spend a lot of time talking about how to improve Mo Health Net. And one way to make it cheaper is to get rid of all the people we're covering on it. That'd be an easy way to do it. But we'd have more uncompensated health care. This isn't a this isn't a uh, a situation where people have a choice. They're going to get health care when they go into that hospital anyway. So it's it's that 
bringing it, bringing the, talking about that is, I mean, how do we do it? Do we either have to balance it one way or the other? As I'm understanding. Thank you. This is a, a really important piece. The right now, about overall, about 14 percent of the patients have no insurance when they go to the hospital. And about 60% of those are above 100% of the federal poverty level. So under the ACA, that 60% of that 14% are going to get tax credits to help <coughs> them buy insurance under the commercial market. And commercial insurance pays about 120 to 130% of Medicare rates. Well, right now the hospitals are seeing them are getting nothing except for the dish. So the dish, which pays about 40%, is going to go away with that 60% of that 14%. But now the hospital is going to get 120 to 130% of Medicare for taking care of those people. Well, they're already getting paid now. The, yes, they're getting 40% of the dish, but the other 60% of taking care of them is buried in the in the premium rest. that you and I pay when we buy our health insurance. So they're already getting paid now. And under the ACA, they're going to get more than double paid because they're going to get 120 to 130 percent for that slice. And there's nothing in the ACA that mean, that makes the cost shift go away. You and I will still pay our higher <coughs> premium, I mean, as long as the hospitals negotiate that. Well, I... You lost me there, Senator. Your last statement was kind of an assumption. Well, there's nothing in the ACA that says that insurance companies have to charge less to for the premiums that they pay. Well, there is. There's market forces that will, will that will bring it down because more people will be covered over over a period of time. But right. meanwhile, the hospitals are going to get double paid. They they are not going to to lose anything. And if market forces work, then they'll just simply charge us more to make up the difference. Well, they won't have to because more people will be covered. Okay. Well, so, but I, but I, I mean, you, you, you and I, we, we, we're, our minds are on to this, that, that we have to make sure it's, a, because the idea of it is that more people are covered, which should reduce everybody else's. And we should do what we can to make that happen. So well, I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that. We either going to pay through our premiums or through our tax. Well, my contention is we're, we're already paying for our taxes, so let's do that. Thank you. Here are the few slides relating to ACA. Um, under 65 with incomes, it allows the increase of eligibility up to 138% of the federal poverty level. It is a significant eligibility change for Missouri. Now our parents are up to 19% of federal poverty level. Uh, we don't cover non-custodial adults unless the seniors are disabled. Uh, it does allow for a medically frail designation. It's 100% federally funded for the first three fiscal years. Um, state share phases up to 10% in the next few lines there from five to 10 over time. Uh, this is uh, budget and planning. I believe these are the numbers that Linda has been using when she talks about projections of people. Senator she had asked about that earlier. So they are kind of shows you the different uh, number of people under the expansion. Um, this is my final slide here. Transfer transformation considerations. When we talked about that, you'll likely want to think about access, think about quality, uh, sustainable financing over time, which is a 10% match. Uh, what, how do you get there? Service delivery, is it a deeper service model, managed care model, is it some, a hybrid, is it an ASO, is it however and that would be a recommendation that the committee would want to think about how services are delivered. 
personal responsibility. I didn't go into copays, but under the Medicaid <coughs> program, a, a nominal copay amount can be charged for to um, persons that are Medicaid eligible. You can't charge copays on kids. There are some restrictions to copays. I know some states, in the reading that I was doing over the weekend, um, some states have increased their copays for emergency rooms to try to incentivize uh, people not going to the emergency rooms and going to urgent care centers. Um, provider reimbursement levels, to Dr. Schaff's point earlier, you know, a lot of our fee-for-service providers aren't being paid um, up to Medicare rates. Senator Sater was, well, is that really the, the appropriate benchmark, benchmark we're talking about? So we want to think about that. Eligibility levels. Uh, if you decide to do an expansion or recommend an expansion, do you really, is it appropriate to keep pregnant women at 185? Or do you want to bring them down to 138? Um, you know, what is the appropriate current level of, or appropriate level of eligibility? And then the one other thing that I would think about would be the organization structure to support the transfer, transformation. And one of the things when, you, when we talk about the four departments, um, in that there's been some house proposals that they, they want to consolidate the Medicaid agency to do cuts, you know, like to save money. And you would consolidate the Medicaid services that are provided in health, mental health, and social services. And just from being out there for the years that I worked in social services, it was a great department, great experience, but there's not a lot of, I would never organ, reorganize to cut, I think I would reorganize to be more efficient, to make sure that the good waiver writing people that are in mental health are also working on chronic um, waivers or waivers that are in social services. So that might be a suggestion that as you're thinking about how you structure, you know, what state staff you have, how would you use those state staff in the best way um, that you, you can. That's all that I had. Senator Sater? Um, Mark, on the co base, there is no, I mean, if the person doesn't have the money, they get the services anyway, don't they? Uh, that's correct. Um, and probably there's a lot of the, um, recipients that know that. I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, could you tell me the number of childless adults on the expansion? What was that figure? Again? There we go. Mm -hmm. we've never, well, we haven't covered that population since before 2005. Right. And as Brian right. said, Brian said yes, yes. Active with their child. Yes. Okay. So. But I think in this case, this population group is targeted at those individuals that are, you know, single or married that don't have kids, never had those uh, right. 18 to 30 year old. <laughs> Bulletproof mm -hmm. individuals that think they don't need insurance. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Senator Jennifer? Arthur will uh, copy <coughs> this presentation be given to the committee. Yes. Thank and you. I assume it will probably be on the website too. That's our view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, under the uh, ACA, the, enro the uh, enrollment system would have to be compatible to the exchange. Isn't that correct? Are you referring to the eligibility determination system? The enrollment system. <laughs> yes, and there was, um, there was, correct, there was money added in the budget, appropriated in the budget this year, and there was a contract signed last week with a Florida-based firm to redesign and implement and maintain that new eligibility system as you said, so that when an individual comes in, um, whether or not Medicaid expansion happens, if an individual comes in and says, no, you need to go to the exchange, or no, you need to go to Medicaid for health care. So yes, that is in the process and will be implemented a new system. So how much funding will come from the feds to implement the new system? I believe that's 90-10. 
and I think the estimate of the first five years was around 110 million, give or take a couple million. So the state will be kicking in about uh, 10 or 11 million, and the feds will be kicking in the other uh, 90, 110, 100 million. Okay, so it'll be 90 million coming from the feds. Approximately, yes. Approximately. It's a 90 10 match. And, so, and they, you said something about what happened last week? Something happened last week? There was a contract signed and uh, um, awarded to a Florida based firm to redesign the uh, famous system, which is the eligibility system. And the contract, was it a, a no bid contract? Was it, was it a put out no, to bid? It was put out to bid, and there were three, four companies that four companies that bid on that, and that was the I believe that was the lowest bid, but also uh, the department felt that that was the best uh, contract that was submitted. And then that we didn't um, implement um, the Medicaid expansion during this last session, how much uh, how much will we stand to lose as a result of that for this for 2014? I believe based on the governor's recommendation for the six months of this fiscal year it was around uh, 900 million that the uh, feds based on how they the governor recommended uh, implementing the system 900 million yes and how many people could have been covered by 2014 if we would have expanded uh, that would be similar to that slide that uh, marga had up i'm just saying the 2014 portion of it. right about approximately two, how many 200, approximately 260,000. so right now 260,000 people will not be eligible for uh, health care due to the fact that we didn't act on it this last session. Correct, for this fiscal year, correct. So next year, because this fiscal year is gone, right? So next year, is that 2015, how many people will be eligible there? I can only see. Uh, About 270 approximately based on the... It's 270. 268, 268. So there is another a 268. Well, that's not added on to it. That's just uh, like a percentage growth that they're figuring. So that's the, that's the guesstimation. Correct. It's an estimate, yes. Okay. Senator Wilson. Margo, you mentioned some other states that have done some emergency ward copay. Did that pay a waiver? Did that pay a waiver to do that? I'm not sure. I believe the copays would be in a state plan, but I, I'm not for sure. The article that I was reading didn't say whether it was a state plan or a waiver. Yeah, someone mentioned think out of the box. I, if they didn't pay that copay and they were on other other government services, could that copay be taken out of their other checks? Senator, I'll, I'll give this a shot. And I don't think, I think the answer is probably no. Uh, generally, with regard to copays and Medicaid coverage, CMS has allowed states to implement copays, but has, has stopped short of requiring that they be done, uh, that they be made in order to provide service. As states expand up the income level, then those rules do start to change some. And for example, with our CHIP program, once we're above 150% of poverty, there's a premium required. If that premium isn't paid, then coverage isn't provided. So the answer is, is generally no. I don't think there would be, uh, I'm not aware of any opportunity for us to say take it out of a food benefit or something like that if there was a copay. Can't say we ever asked, uh, but the general rule I think would be that the farther you are down that income poverty level, I only know one way to change behavior, and it's generally out of the pocket. And I, I get my only point is if you've got someone who's going to go to the most expensive place there is to get their health care, if you charge a higher copay to direct them to a clinic, I'm not saying they can't get health care, just go to the place where it costs less. It just seems like that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Any other questions for this panel? Mr. Yes. I haven't done, gotten to talk with you yesterday. 
Oh, you're going to speak next? Okay. Um, you know, I, I've always been concerned about access to care, and we do have a problem with access to care. I know uh, Senator Shaw has mentioned about uh, it's almost impossible to get a Medicaid uh, recipient in to see an internist or a specialist. I believe you mentioned that before. Kind of this takes months and months, <laughs> hundreds of times. And it's also getting more difficult just to see a primary care physician. I mean, even myself. You know, I just don't walk in there and say, hey, I'm David, can you see me? Uh, that doesn't ha happen too much. <clears throat> um, so if we're going to increase the roles of Medicaid to 260-some thousand people uh, the first year, and we're going to flood the market with these people, do you see a access problem because of the current um, number of providers that we have? Well, just in reading all the materials and you know, hearing about it, that's definitely a consideration is the access to care and trying to figure out. Um, so you could see where health care outcomes could actually decrease because of Medicaid expansion. 